Thanks, Matt. Um, first, I'd just like to say thank you to Lucy and Karis for inviting me. Um, I've really enjoyed these seminar series, so it's a great pleasure to be here today to be part of that. And as Matt said, today I'm going to be talking about some of my work to do with hybridization. And although I'm mainly going to be telling you results about non-human primate hybridization, I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to persuade you that it has relevance to hominins as well. Okay, sorry, just checking my slides are working. So hybrids. Um, humans, I think, have been fascinated with hybrids for pretty much as long as we have some kind of record of what captures the imagination of the human mind. Um, we've got evidence from cave paintings that people were thinking about something that was kind of a hybrid beast between a human and an animal. We see many representations and mytho mythologies from lots of different cultures. And up until today, it's kind of an internet thing of people creating hybrids of these strange um, intermediates between different types of animals, whether that's using drawing or through Photoshop. I think humans are really fascinated by hybrids because we like to put things in boxes. We like to classify things. And so a hybrid, which is neither one, one thing nor another, is something that fascinates us. But what really is a hybrid? It seems kind of, it seems easy enough. A hybrid is generally um, defined as something which is a cross between two species. But that's not as simple as it might seem. And that's because the idea of what a species is, is not as cut and dry as one might think. The species concept that non-specialists are usually most familiar with is the biological species concept. And this was coined by Maya in the 1940s. This is the idea that two members of a species can reproduce and have fertile offspring. However, that's not the only species concept. It's not even the most widely used species concept in all fields of biology. Other species concepts, for example, use things like mate recognition to form groups which are called species. So if two um, individuals recognize each other as mates, they are members of the same species. One of the, the reasons why the biological species concept is not used that widely, or it's not used for all taxa, is because there are lots of um, widely expected species that it doesn't apply to. Many widely expect, uh, accepted species can reproduce and have fertile offspring. It's also true that many potential mating partners will never actually meet and breed in the wild. So it's not necessarily a biologically realistic way of categorizing uh, the world. Of course, it, all, it also has only limited utility for fossils. Ancient DNA notwithstanding, we don't necessarily know where the fossils would have been able to interbreed and have fertile offspring. So in paleontology, often other uh, species concepts such as phonetic species concepts are used. So I think we can say that although species do have some biological reality, species concept structs that we use are something that humans are putting onto nature. So there isn't a kind of one-to-one -one relationship between how we want to divide nature and the biological truth underneath that. And why I'm talking about this, other than I think it's fascinating and it's sort of a, a pet passion of mine, is that I think the way that we look at species has affected the way we think about hybrids. So this historical or perhaps non-specialist idea that um, species are uh, reproductively isolated leads to the idea that hybridization is likely to be rare and that hybrids are either sterile or much less fit. It's, it leads to the sort of thinking that species are adapted to their own particular niches and so intermediates between those two, the hybrid offspring, are likely to be much less fit, less fit in either of the parental ecological niches. So it leads to the thinking that hybrids are evolutionary dead ends. However, this is not necessarily the case and it's becoming much more recognized now, starting probably in botany, but also much more widely now in zoology and other branches of uh, biology, that hybridization is actually a very creative force within evolution. And some of this is, is quite obvious if you think about it, even if a hybrid is less fit in either of its parents' niches, if it's intermediate, it may be um, fit in, it may be more fit in other ecological niches. It's not like there's only two niches, the parental niches and everything else is, is, um, is that, that, that those are the only two options. So even if you're an intermediate between those, you might be able to go and find your own niche in which you would be more fit than either of your parent taxa. And this is particularly relevant if the environment is changing. So the hybrid might be more fit in a new environment. And even if it's true, that the hybrid is less fit um, or sterile, it can actually increase reductive barriers between the parental taxa, and so lead to um, greater divergence between them, which is also a creative force. 
I think the most important role of uh, hybridization, however, in terms of an e as being an evolutionary process, is that it's a source of variation. Hybrids, uh, hybridization leads to greater rates of variation, or higher rates of variation than the mutation rate in a stable population. And variation is the raw material of evolution. It's what natural selection, sexual selection act on, and also leads to new, greater neutral um, variation as well. So if there's more variation in a hybrid popula population than in either parental population, that is something that evolution will then act upon. Not only does it lead to larger kind of background variation, it's also a source of kind of whole adaptive complexes, which can be transmitted from one generation to the next due to the reassortment of functional gene complexes. So that's a really fast way of getting an adaptation. Obviously you might get a maladaptive suite of genes, but you can get something which adapts you to a particular environment in one generation. Um, one example of this, which I really like, is that there's apparently a bit of uh, lion DNA in Jaguar genomes which seems to help them with visual acuity. And that's happened after the split between jaguars and lions. So this hybrid integration has given jaguars better vision. And another example of where that might be um, useful, uh, adaptive in terms of today's very quickly changing environment is in the interbreeding between polar bears and grizzly bears. Polar bears and grizzly bears have been interbreeding for thousands of years. And we now know that there's grizzly bear and mitochondrial DNA in polar bears and uh, polar bear nuclear DNA in grizzly bears. And it's been suggested that this integration might help polar bears to adapt to the warming climate and the melting of the sea ice. So particularly when change is much faster, such as during anthropogenic climate change, uh, hybridization can be very useful for different species. I think we're all familiar with the idea that not having not enough variation is maladaptive particularly people who are familiar with domestic animals or domestic plants will be aware of this. Inbreeding depression occurs when there is an insufficient genetic diversity. And you can also get things like uh, an accumulation of genetic errors, maladaptive traits will be more likely to have an effect. And you might have reduced adaptability, particularly if there's um, a change in the environment. So if you don't have much genetic diversity, you, you aren't able to act on, um, to uh, adapt to the environment as it changes. You won't have that capacity within your genome. One example of uh, where this might have occurred is in the Habsburg Empire. So the Habsburgs ruled um, a large part of, of Europe and also Southwest Asia, uh, sorry, Western Asia, um, I think, uh, for several hundred years. Um, and what we see here is Charles II of Spain, who was the last Habsburg emperor. Not only does he have the Habsburg jaw, which is this characteristic shape of his chin, which is perhaps not the most beautiful characteristic, but he also suffered from ill health, both mentally and physically throughout his life. And he was unable to further the Habsburg line because he was infertile. So that's why he was the end of the Habsburg line. So we can see that in inbreeding, as we see in some royal families, um, can lead to negative consequences. And this is perhaps relevant to human evolution because we know that um, in some extinct hominid species, there were very low levels of genetic diversity. We've seen this both from the Altai Neanderthal in Denisovan cave and also from Denisovans, Denisovans in Denisova cave, both show very low levels of genetic diversity and um, substantial inbreeding. Uh, I think the same has been shown for Neanderthals from El Cedron in Spain. So if both of these taxa had relatively low levels of genetic diversity, you can see how interbreeding either with each other or with Homo sapiens might have been quite beneficial for their genomes and for the health of their populations. So how common is hybridization in species in general? Well, we're discovering more and more hybrids all the time, and that's largely with genetic analyses. Um, many uh, hybrids which were first discovered were between species that were brightly patterned. So if you have um, a highly colored pattern coat, for example, then hybrids um, tend to have a slightly different pattern, and that's something that could be picked up on. In species that are perhaps smaller or more drab, it's taken genetics to, to show that these hybrids are present. Um, so these numbers will probably go up. In fact, I think um, some of the statistics are, are slightly, um, some of these percentages are slightly old, but it seems that they're rare within a species. Not very many individuals will be hybrids, but they're common across species. So at least 25% of plants, for example, show hybridization. And within our own order in non-human primates, we would also expect to see hybridization. 
it's been suggested that reproductive isolation, so the, um, the cessation of interfertility, takes about two to four million years to build up. And there are many primate species which are less old than that. So about seven to 10 percent I've got here of non-human primate species are known to hybridize. I think that uh, number probably is a little bit higher. I know I saw um, uh, the headline for a paper about gibbons the other day, which I don't think had been recorded as hybridizing before. So this pro number probably is slightly greater. And there are even species of primate which are thought to have um, arisen from hybridization, such as Tra Trachypithecus biliatus, one of the leaf monkeys, and one of the macaques, Ma Macaca arctoides. So it's something that is quite common and to be expected within nature in general and within our own order. Because there's only one species of human alive today, people have looked at hybridization in non-human primates, even if they're interested in hybridization in human evolution. Becky Ackerman has been a pioneer in this and she's looked a lot at baboon hybrids, both at the uh, Southwest Foundation for Biomedical Research in Texas and also in wild populations. And from their skeletons, she's come up with a kind of hybrid signature, which she describes as being the consequences of hybridizations in baboons. Individuals who are hybrids tend to have um, a higher level of size variation than either of the parental taxa. Particularly, there are individuals of extreme size, so very large size, and this is known as heterosis. There's quite a high level of individuals who have um, abnormal non-metric traits as well things like dental and sutural anomalies. So you can see here on the right that I've, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse, perhaps not, but on the, on the pictures on the right, you can see supernumerary or extra canines in two individuals. And in one individual, they're bilateral, which is extremely rare in non-hybrids. Ackerman has suggested that these anomalies are due to a breakdown in the coordination of development due to hybridization. However, they don't seem to be detrimental to the individuals, even these extra teeth. So these were analyses on skeletons. There have been um, analyses also in living platyrines uh, in howler monkeys and marmosets. And although they weren't able to look at things like sutural variation, they did see a similar pattern in um, size and variation showing individuals of uh, greater size than parental taxa and also greater variation in size. So it's been suggested that this is something that happens in general with hybridization in primates. So hopefully I've shown that hybridization is a, an important evolutionary mechanism that's happening all the time, which is creating some of the vast diversity that we see. But I'm interested in specifically in the role that hybridization has played in human evolution as an anthropologist. As many of you will be aware, there are fossils which have been claimed for a long time to be hybrids within the fossil record. And these have been debated for many years. And where people stand on that debate has tended to, to relate to their stance on things like the origin of Homo sapiens. So whether they fall in the Act of Africa or multi-regional camps for that. Um, so it, it was a, an area of great debate for many years. Uh, one such example is this uh, child skeleton from Lagavello in Portugal dated to about 25,000 years ago. And it was claimed by the, the team who described it that it was a mosaic of Homo sapiens and Neanderthal features. They weren't claiming that it was a first generation uh, hybrid, but they suggested that there were some Neanderthal features and that they showed Neanderthal ancestry further back in this individual's lineage. However, other authors, such as Tatisal and Schwartz, looked at this and said that no, it's just merely part of the general range of Homo sapiens variation, which is considerable. And they described it simply as a, a chunky Gravettian child. So you can see that this is a debate that could rage without any conclusion, and, and it did for many years. And that was really until the dawn of the paleogenomic revolution. And by that, I mean, when the first ancient DNA started to be, being, to be sequenced from hominins. This started in 1997 with the sequencing of the Neanderthal micro, um, mitochondrial DNA genome. And then in 2010, the first partial um, genome of a Neanderthal was sequenced and it was shown that there had in fact been interbreeding between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, which was really exciting and kind of changed the way we thought about ourselves and our relationships to Neanderthals a bit, I think. And then in 2018, there was an amazing discovery made of this tiny, uninteresting looking fragment of bone. First of all, it was discovered that it was hominin using a technique called zooms or zoological mass spectrometry. And this looks at the peptides or the proteins in the bone and it can identify which taxon it belongs to. So it's found that it was a hominin and then they were managed to get ancient DNA from it to discover what species it was. 
And this is partly because this remain, uh, this fragment comes from Denisova cave, which is in Siberia, as I said. So it's got very good um, conditions for the preservation of DNA and protein. It's very cold and dry. So when they sequenced this amazing quality ancient DNA, they found out that it was half Denisovan and half, half Neanderthal, which I imagine was quite a surprise. So this is a first generation hybrid, uh, a young female, definitely a female, um, who had a Denisovan father and a Neanderthal mother. And it seems like an incredible thing to find, you know, first generation hybrids must be pretty rare. But I think the fact we found it might um, also suggest that hybridization was going on with reasonable frequency, at least in this time and this place. And um, one reason I say this is that the, the authors report that the Denisovan father of this hybrid individual also had Neanderthal ancestry in his own lineage a few generations back. So it seems that in this area of Denisova, which is probably at the extreme of the range of both Neanderthals and Denisovans, so probably relatively low population densities, there was interbreeding going on relatively regularly between these two populations, or at least it wasn't a one-off. So these ancient DNA uh, analyses um, and improvements in techniques have really revolutionized our ability to say something about hybridization. But as I was just saying, the, the preservation in um, Denisova Cave is really remarkable. There are a lot of fossils that we would look, like to look at that come from places where the preservation is just not going to be as good. Um, the entire African fossil record, for example, which is obviously key to human evolution. So although we can now look at hybridization using ancient DNA, it's still important that we are able to look at hybridization using the morphology as well. So that's what I'm particularly interested in. There are some problems with this, however. Um, some of the key problems that we come across are things like sample sizes. So I've been talking about variation and that being a marker of hybridization. And to look at variation, you need to have a certain number of individuals. If you've just got one, you really can't say much about it. So even though we have more Neanderthals than we have of any other fossil taxon, we still don't have that many. and We don't have that many from any particular area. So that's something that's quite hard to look at. We've also been talking, or I've been talking a bit about mosaics of morphology. So shared characteristics that we, we, we would expect to see in a Neanderthal perhaps, but then is present in a Homo sapiens. And the problem with that is that unless you know what the last common ancestor is between those two um, in the taxa, then it's quite hard to unpick what the reason for that trait being there is. It could be shared because it's a primitive trait. It could be due to hybridization. It could be due to convergent or parallel evolution. And it's difficult to unpick that if you don't know what the, um, what the primitive state is. And the problem with that is that for most, if not all of human evolution, we don't know what the last common ancestors are. We don't know what the last common ancestor is for, between humans and uh, Neanderthals, for example. So these are things that perhaps we can get at in some ways. One of the things that we're unlikely to be able to address is that by looking at the skeletal morphology, we're only going to be able to look at a proportion of hybrids in any case. Some hybrids we know from um, other species where we can look at their DNA more easily are only visible in the, in the DNA. You can't see anything in their phenotype and they're known as cryptic hybrids. And then there are also those hybrids where the signature of the hybridization is only visible in the soft tissue. So for example, in monkeys or other non-human primates, the hybrids are quite often recognized by their coat patterns, whereas obviously that doesn't fossilize, so we're not able to see that. So there are, there are some challenges, but there's also some hope. Uh, this, these two fossils come from Oase in Romania and they're dated to about 40,000 years ago. And since they were first described in 2003, again, like Lagavello, they've been argued to show hybrid morphology. For example, in the mandible, the third molar, which is here at the top, is very large. And actually the molars, um, sorry, no, that's the, the, it's the right way up. So the third molar is the um, bottom of the mandible, but it's very large. And in fact, it's the, it's the largest tooth. So in Homo sapiens, the trend is usually for the third molar to be the smallest. So it's morphology like this that was argued to show Neanderthal ancestry in this individual. Um, and that was an, uh, an area of debate for many years until 2015, when um, the mandible was sampled for ancient DNA, as you can see, that's got a chunk out of it. And Fu et al were able to show that there was indeed Neanderthal ancestry in this individual. Uh, there's the fragment size and the amount of it 
showed that this individual had a, a Neanderthal ancestor about four to six generations previously. So that's more or less the order of a great, great grandparent to a great, 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 great grandparent. So relatively um, soon to the time at which they lived. Now we don't know what the relationship is between the Neanderthal DNA that this individual has and the morphological features which were suggested to be Neanderthal-like, but it does at least show that they're both occur in the same individual, which suggests perhaps that we can see Neanderthal, um, that we can see hybridization within uh, hominin fossils. So this has all really been to give you some background to the project which I've been working on. And this is the, uh, the project which I've been part of. It's the brainchild originally of David Cates when he was at the University of California in Davis. And it's now led by Tim Weaver, who is his still um, leader of the lab uh, in um, morphology in uh, the evolutionary wing of the anthropology department at UC Davis. And you see his, his lab there at the time that I was there um, in that picture. And it's also a collaborative project. It's working with people from other institutions as well, with Leslie Leslie Lusco and Becky Rogers Ackerman and Sri Kanthaswamy. So it um, has expertise from both morphological and genetic sides, and it's funded by the National Science Foundation and the Leakey Foundation. And the main point of this project is to look at how hybridization affects morphology in macaques, and whether we can use what we learned from that relationship to predict morphology in fossil hominins. Since uh, 2018, I've been working on this, and until um, I published the, the paper a few months ago, I was mainly working on the pelvis. So most of what I'm going to describe today is results from the pelvis with a little bit at the end of some of my very recent um, investigations into the rest of the postcranial skeleton. So this project, as I said, was, um, was originally an idea that came from David Cates. And the reason that he thought about it was that there's a really interesting sample that was available at uh, the California National Primate Research Center, which is housed at the University of California, Davis. There's a large colony of Indian rhesus macaques here. And in the 1980s, a small number of Chinese rhesus macaques were introduced into the, um, the colony to improve the genetic diversity within the colony. Um, Chinese and, and Indian rhesus macaques, although they are part of the same species, are quite different morphologically uh, in some respects and molecularly. In fact, it's it's suggested that it's a polyphyletic taxon. So those two groups of the same species are more different from one another than some of the, than they are to some other closely related species. However, it's it's not been formally divided into subspecies. So I tend to refer to them as Chinese and Indian rhesus macaques um, uh, or groups, uh, although I think I do refer to them as subspecies um, later on. So the exact taxonomic difference between them is unsettled. But what's interesting about them in the context of human evolution is that the split time between them in terms of generations is about the same as that between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. So obviously the hominins have a longer generation time, but between both of them, there's about 21,000 generations. So the, the phylogenetic divergence is similar. It's also a very good sample because it's multi-generational. So these individuals have been interbreeding for over 25 years. So we don't just have kind of first generation hybrids, we have um, back crossing, we have a good distribution of Chinese ancestry from 100%, so fully Chinese uh, rhesus macaques, to very small percentages and obviously to Indian individuals. So as I said, this was originally an Indian um, rhesus macaque colony, and it has a small amount of input from the Chinese rhesus macaques. So it's analogous to a Homo sapiens population with a small amount of Neanderthal uh, introgression. I mentioned that I've mostly been looking at the pelvis and there's several reasons for that. The first is that the pelvis is an interesting and complex shape. Other than the, the cranium, it's the most kind of complex part of the, the skeleton, which means that it's free to vary in lots of different directions and adapt in various different ways. It's also subject to competing restraint constraints. So it's affected, or affected by the constraints relating to locomotion and also to obstetrics, to giving birth. And that latter one is particularly important because if you don't give birth properly, if the, if the child can't pass through the mother's pelvis, then both mother and child are likely to die. So they'll be removed from the gene pool and it's a very sharp selective pressure. So the shape of the pelvis and how that relates 
to hybridization can have very severe consequences for the viability of a hybrid. It's also an interesting area to look at in terms of humans and Neanderthals, because it's one of the regions of the skeleton which differs most between those species. So it's a, it's a region where there's definite differences between the taxa, which would also then have um, potential consequences for the viability of their hybrids. So many of you will be very familiar with geometric morphometrics or GMM, which are the methods that I've been using. Um, for those of you who aren't, I'm just going to talk about them very briefly, but if you have more questions, then please ask me at the end. I don't want this to be kind of a talk about methods because I'm not sure that that's the mo most interesting thing I have to say. But suffice it to say that um, GMM is a quantitative shape analysis technique that uses landmarks. And these are points which we put on each individual in the same place and then we compare where those points are in three dimensions. It allows us to preserve the geometry and to compare the shapes in three dimensions. So you can see on the bottom right there, I've got um, two pelvic shapes, which are uh, obviously 3D individuals. Um, here, this is a gift just spinning by itself, but I could also manipulate it. I can look at those differences in shape. And what's quite powerful is also I can create hypothetical shapes. So in fact, these are mean male and female shapes, which I can then compare. So you can model shape, you can manipulate it, you can um, use dimension reduction techniques such as principal components analysis, and you see a principal components uh, plot, a PC uh, plot at the top there, and that um, condenses the variation into successive axes. So PC1 will explain the greatest variation in the sample, and I can look at where particular points are on that plot, and those are the shapes of specific individuals, and the distances between them correspond to quantitative differences in shape between those individuals. So I can then take those variables and compare them or to other variables, things like environment, or in this case, to see how they vary with ancestry, with the amount of Chinese ancestry in my rhesus macaques. This is just a quick diagram to show how I got my data. Um, our macaques are largely living, they no macaques were killed for this study, but we do have some um, skeletons which we've got after the macaques have died of natural causes, but all of our primary data come from CT scans of the monkeys, so they're full body scans, we have all the soft tissue, which we'll, we hope will be useful in the future for subsequent analyses, and all the bones are in anatomical position. So what we have to do is virtually remove the skeletons from the bodies, and we do that based on the density of the tissues. So you can see in the middle of that stack of um, lying down monkeys, a slice through the monkey. And hopefully you can see that the, the white of the bones is a different color, so a different density than the other tissue. So you can threshold out the skeleton based on this density. Lots of it can be done automatically. Some of it, especially the very finest, thinnest bits of bone, do usually have to be done manually, uh, which takes a very long time. But eventually you end up with a nice clean virtual monkey skeleton, as you see at the top. And then the same process can be repeated to isolate the pelvis from the rest of the, the skeleton. And then I've made this into a virtual um, model, which I've colored blue so that it stands out nicely against the yellow landmarks, but that is the data that I'm working with. So you can see my landmarks on there. For those who are interested in such things, I've got 48 true landmarks and 156 semi-landmarks. So the, the true landmarks are repeatable points on e each individual, whereas the semi-landmarks, each individual landmark doesn't really tell you much about um, its position, but the overall shape, such as the curve around the pelvic in inlet, is described by numbers of um, semi-landmarks. So overall, there's 204 of them. And the shape that you see below that, that kind of diagram of a pelvis, is what's called a wireframe. And that merely joins together all the landmarks, and it helps with visualization. If I just showed you the landmarks, then it would look like a cloud of points. So it just helps you to, to see what's going on. Um, you should remember though, that the points themselves are what holds the information. So the, there are some lines which join them together, which are just inferred. There's no actual morphology between them. And that's why the obturatus foramen look kind of like triangles because they're just joining those points together. So you'll be seeing quite a lot of these as I model the differences in shape between different pelvises. The sample that I used for the pelvis, pelvic analyses were 138 of our macaques. And you will see from the table at the bottom there um, that I have many more males, uh, sorry, females than males. And that's due to the structure of the colony. In order to avoid fighting within the colony, they keep the number of males deliberately low. 
And again, the breakdown of percentage of Chinese ancestry, which you can see in that uh, pie chart also reflects the structure of the, the colony, the, what is going on naturally in the colony. So we, ha we have more individuals who have 12.5% Chinese ancestry than we do 87.5% um, 80, ancestry because that's the way that the, uh, the monkeys have chosen to mate. We do have, a, however, have a good representation of, um, we do have individuals from each of these categories, even if the proportions are not the same. Um, and we have a number of full-bred Indian and full-bred Chinese animals as well. So as I mentioned earlier, the pelvis is a structure which is obviously related to birth. So it tends to be very sexually dimorphic. Um, when Schultz did his classic study, he put the macaques as being intermediate between humans and great apes in terms of constraints. So in terms of sexual dimorphism. Uh, so for those of you not familiar with that, I mean that um, humans have a very constrained relationship between the pelvis of the mother and the cranium of the neonate. Um, and so you would expect there to be quite a strong relationship between mother's pelvic shape and um, child's cranial shape. Great apes, on the other hand, have a lot of space in their pelvises. They, they give birth without much difficulty, and so perhaps you'd expect a less strong relationship. Uh, Schultz showed that the macaques were intermediate between that, although more recent analyses by Kuwazawa actually show that macaques may be as constrained as humans. So we thought that this was something we needed to look at, whether there's a lot of sexual dimorphism in pelvic shape. And you can see a PCA here, which is a plot showing the greatest variation within the shape of the pelvis. The PC1, which is the x-axis, shows the dimension of greatest variation. And I've colored the, the macaques by their sex. And there's quite a good um, separation on PC1 showing that they're quite different in shape based on their sex. And when we look at uh, that statistically with the Procrustes ANOVA, we see that indeed uh, sex explains about 18% of the difference in shape within our sample. Here are some of these wireframes on the right, which I was describing. And those model the minimum and maximum shapes on that PCA, uh, sorry, PC1. So I've chosen the extremes rather than the uh, means to magnify what's going on with that PC, um, with that axis of shape change. So the, the blue shape is showing you what the females are more like, and the gray shape is showing you where the male shapes are, are falling towards that end. Um, the main thing to take away from this is the greater anterior posterior dimensions around the pubic synthesis in the females. So that's likely related to having a, a pelvic inlet that can deal with um, giving birth. So that's an expected consequence of sexual dimorphism. And then we start to look at the effect of admixture. And this is now the exact same PCA, but instead of coloring it by sex, I've covered, colored it by the amount of um, Indian uh, ancestry. And hopefully you can see that key along the bottom. So red is 100% Indian and blue is 100% Chinese ancestry. And I haven't drawn those convex hulls because it would be just a mess of overlapping. There's very little structure, if any. Um, so that's showing the effect that sex has probably. So in order to, we know that sex has a strong effect. In order to look at what are probably more subtle effects, we had to adjust for sex or hold it constant so we could see what else was going on. And to do that, we used a, a regression analysis. And we use the residuals from that um, regression of sex on shape to look at the more subtle patterns of ancestry. So the subsequent uh, results that I'm talking about are with sex held constant. And when we look at those residuals, we find that China's, Chinese ancestry does explain some of shape variation. There's a significant relationship between the two, but it's a small percentage, it's a very weak relationship, only about 2% of that variation. However, using geometric morphometrics, we can separate out just the shape which is related to ancestry and have a closer look at it. So this is a regression score plot, and it's basically a vector through the data which best explains the, data, the relationship between ancestry and shape, and then the data are projected onto it. And you can see that there is some kind of um, relationship between the two. Um, and where they're falling, you can see that the, the greater amounts of Chinese ancestry tend to fall towards the top of this axis, and the uh, individuals with less or no Chinese ancestry tend to fall towards the bottom. So it's looking pretty much like a linear relationship, which would suggest that if you have more Chinese ancestry, your pelvis looks more Chinese-like. 
And um, so to have a look at this in more detail, I've modeled again what the pelvis look like. And in this case, the uh, again, is the extremes of that axis. So the top and the bottom of that regression score axis. These are very small um, shape changes, as you would expect, given that it's only expect, uh, explaining 2% of the variation in shape. So I've magnified them by two. And I'd like you to look at things like the shape of the iliac blades at the top, the positioning of the medial border of the ischial tuberosities. If I had a pointer, I would uh, show it, but I don't think you can see my, my mouse. Um, the angle of the sacrum, which you can see from the side, and also the placement of the pubic symphysis. So bear those in mind. So having looked at the admixed individuals at the full sample, we then had a look at the full bred animals to see if that shed any light on what was going on. This is again um, individuals where sex has been controlled uh, for, so these are, are residuals. And this is another PCA. Um, and if you look at the axis of greatest variation, so PC1, you can see that there's a little bit more structure. There is some separation on PC1, um, and that's reflected in the results. So there's a significant relationship, and there's a bit of a stronger uh, relationship here. Subspecies designation, or in other words, whether a macaque is Chinese or Indian, explains about 7% of this shape. So it's not a strong effect, but it is stronger than we see within the full sample. So if we again take just that shape and have a look at what's going on, we can use a regression plot and we can model the, the shapes within that. In this case, I've looked at the mean Indian and Chinese shapes rather than the extremes because I thought that was more informative. So have a look at some of these differences again. You can see the difference in shape in those iliac blades, the, position, the, position, the positioning of the medial borders of the issue of tuberosities, the, position, position, the, the placement of the um, pubic symphysis, and the angle of the sacrum. It looks very familiar. It looks very similar to what we saw on the last slide, if you're following along with me. At least having looked at many, many of these when I was doing the analyses, they look very familiar to me, although they are obviously greater in, um, in magnitude. And this is, um, this is what we would expect to see based on the last data. So it is showing again that more Chinese ancestry makes the shape of the pelvis more approximate um, the Chinese mean shape. I'm going to show you that in a, a bit of an easier way to see. So on your left here, you have the complete sample and the blue lines show um, individuals towards the top of the regression score, which have generally more Chinese ancestry. And then on the right side, the blue lines are showing the Chinese mean shape. And hopefully you will agree that those shapes are very similar or the differences between the red and the blue line are very similar in both cases although the magnitude is different. Again, you can see the utility of working with 3D models in that you can flip them around, look at what's going on in different places. So this suggested to us that this was an additive or a linear relationship, but we tested this out in, in another way. So to do that, we created a shape vector based on the full breads. Uh, so it's a kind of idealized line onto which we projected all the other data. So we created an artificial linear relationship with our data, which is what you see on the left there. And then we compared that to our actual data. And hopefully you will agree that these two plots are extremely similar. So we are suggesting that there's a linear um, relationship between the change in shape and the amount of Chinese ancestry, such that they're changing at a, a regular rate more Chinese ancestry means more Chinese pelvic shape within our sample. Although it should be remembered that this is a weak relationship. So to summarize this part of, of the talk, I think perhaps I've gone quite fast and I might finish a bit early, but um, you can always ask me about things that I may not have gone into in enough depth. Enough, enough depth. So the results seem to be suggesting that there's this linear relationship, but it is a weak one. And there are some reasons why this might be the case. One might be the part of the, the skeleton that we're looking at. As I said, we're looking at the pelvis, which is um, subject to competing constraints. So it's possible that it's being canalized, that stabilizing selection is acting on it and not allowing it to vary very much. And one way that we're going to check this out is by looking at other regions of the skeleton. We're looking at the cranium and the rest of the postcranial skeleton, which um, the rest of the postcranial skeleton in particular 
should be more free to vary. The weak effect might also be to do with the fact that there's not much difference between the full bred, the full bred um, pelvis either though. And that's really interesting. I think based on our understanding of the morphology of the different taxa, it's probably that there's a greater variation in Homo sapiens and Neanderthals than there is in, between the macaque species. So we know that there's quite a lot of variation in humans and macaques. Um, and there's, sorry, in humans and Neanderthals and not that much in macaques. Um, and it seems likely that the, the hominin taxa are the unusual ones in that comparison. There's a couple of reasons why that might be the case. Um, the first is perhaps that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens evolved in quite different climatic circumstances. So Homo sapiens evolved in Africa in a relatively warm climate. Neanderthals evolved in Eurasia in a relatively cold climate. And the pelvis is um, affected by climate in part because it relates to body breadth, which affects surface area, which is um, affected by things like Bergman's rules. So you want to have as, as little surface area as possible if you're in a cold climate to avoid heat loss. So that could be one thing that's playing into this. I think another really interesting possibility, however, is that hominins tend to adapt to their environments largely culturally. And it's been suggested by Jay Stock and other people um, that this might allow them to, to vary neutrally to a greater extent because their phenotypes are um, buffered by their cultural adaptations. So perhaps there's, as has been suggested by people like Tim Weaver, there's greater neutral divergence between humans and Neanderthals in terms of shape, and that's what we're seeing in the pelvis. So I think that's something that I would like to look into in a, in a lot more depth, something that I find really interesting. Are humans kind of weird in the, in the way, or hominins weird in the way in which they vary neutrally, and is that related to our um, dependence on culture? So I'm going to talk through some of my very early stages of a few more analyses that I've just started doing, um, and then come back to some bigger questions at the end. So I've been looking at um, the, the rest of the postcranial skeleton, and this is to come back to some of what I was saying at the beginning. So with previous non-human primate studies, some of the things that we picked that have been picked up on and which I mentioned are things like these extreme sizes and increased variation in size. And so this is something that we can look at with our sample as well. I'm also interested in looking at asymmetry because um, that's something that can tell you about developmental instability, um, which the results of Becky Ackerman and other people, which showed that um, hybrid individuals tended to have often had things like sutural anomalies or dental anomalies, those supernumerary canines, for example, that I was showing you, they suggest um, changes in the developmental pattern which are throwing up these unusual morphologies. So that's something we might also be able to see with um, studies of asymmetry. However, I've, I've been measuring a lot of uh, these skeletons virtually and I haven't finished doing the left-hand side, so that's something I won't be presenting today. What I ha have been doing and what I will be showing you very briefly today is some of the linear measurements of the limbs and the body. So that's looking at the length of the femur, the tibia, the humerus, the radius, and also a measurement from the crown to the rump. So hopefully you can see those lines there. These are the measurements I've been taking. I should note that the crown to rump measurements um, are here taken as a straight line. Um, which is the quickest way of doing it, but is, is affected by the flexion of the neck. And so I think there's quite a lot of variation in this measurement and it would be profitable to go back and try and measure them using a jointed line rather than a straight line. That's not possible in a viso. So I'm looking at some other options in terms of software to do that. Um, I might come back to that later. So hopefully I will be presenting these results in the ABAs in, in March. But this is, as I said, very early preliminary results, so bear with me. So what we were talking about in terms of other um, primate studies were the, the appearance of um, hybrids, which had a lot of variation in size and shape, were perhaps unusual in some way or were extremely large. And we didn't see any of those in the pelvis. So we didn't see any difference in centroid size between the full bred groups and the admixed groups. And we saw no significant differences in variation in size or shape. So we didn't see this kind of expected, perhaps, hybrid signal um, in our pelvic uh, sample. And this is what we're trying to see um, 
in the rest of the postcranial measurements, whether it's something that we just don't see in the pelvis because it's being constrained. So these are some very preliminary results from just the females. Um, I'm showing just the females here because there's obviously quite a large difference in sex, but I haven't controlled for sex across the entire sample because I'm interested in what happens in the individual groups. And some of these groups don't have any males in them. So I'm going to, I'm looking at the females for now. I will probably also control for sex using regression and look at the results from both analyses to see what's going on. Um, but yeah, these are just females at the moment. Um, and so what I'd, I'd like to say is going on at the moment, and this may change with future analyses, but what we see so far is that, again, there's no individuals of extreme size. There are no individuals which are consistently outliers on multiple measurements. Um, so in terms of the hybrids, so the hybrids are not showing um, extreme sizes compared to their full bred taxa. The other thing to look at, which hopefully you can see from these box and violin plots on the right, is that the hybrids, which are those multicolored um, groups in the middle, are not more variable than the parental taxa. The most variable for each of these measurements, and the same goes for the, um, the individual bone load measurements for the limbs, but in terms of space, I, I've combined them as forelimb and hindlimb. The most variable is the Chinese um, fullbreds, which are the ones to the far right in that minty green color. For most of the measurements as well, for both the forelimb and the hindlimb, the next most variable is the Indian. Um, the crown to rump measurements show a slightly different pattern, and I think that's partly probably due to the positioning. Uh, I need to look into that pink group in a bit more detail to see if there are perhaps some individuals with a very extended or um, uh, flexed uh, neck, which might be affecting that result. Um, so rather than the hybrids being very variable, what we actually see is that the, the full breads are much more variable, or at least the Chinese ones are. And this um, difference between the Chinese uh, the level of variation in the Chinese full breads and the Indians is something that's been shown before in, um, in the genetic uh, analyses of these monkeys. And it's probably due to a bottleneck in the Indian populations during the last glacial maximum. Um, so that's nice that that's being captured here as well. So um, to kind of summarize what I can say from what I've done on that so far, in, cron in what the results that we see from our sample, there aren't any um, extremes of sizes or greater variation within the sample. And that's in contrast to some of the other non-human primate studies. And that's probably at least partly because the taxa that have been used whether they're baboons or they're platyrines, they have greater phylogenetic divergence than the macaques that we're looking at. The split times between the two parental taxa are greater, and that's likely to affect the amount of variation in the, um, in the hybrid taxa and the frequency of anomalous morphology. The other thing which is likely to affect that is also the number of early generation or first generation hybrids. So we have um, a population that's been interbreeding for many generations. There's I think only one F1 individual in the sample, and there's only a few which are 50% uh, Chinese and 50% Indian macaque. So that probably explains the difference between our results um, if they're borne out by subsequent analyses. However, I still think our results are relevant to humans and um, Neanderthals because they are closely related taxa. In terms of generation, it's, it's a good analogy. So perhaps we would expect to see more subtle morphological patterns than we previously anticipated, and this can be useful. We also, however, need to look at the effect of phenotypic as well as phylogenetic divergence. So I was just saying that a greater split time seems to lead to more extreme hybrid morphologies, but it's not clear what the effect of the parental taxa having very different morphology might have. And that's something that we need to look at, I think, by looking at more non-human um, primate examples. However, potentially, even if the magnitude of the difference between the parental taxa is um, very different, if the pattern holds, then it's still something that we might be able to apply using the, the, the non-human primate models. So we might be able to create models using what we've learned from the non-human primates and apply those to the, the hybrid, um, sorry, to the hominins, which is what we're planning to do in the future. Um, and that's something that 
we will then need to test against the fossil record. Just to, to finish um, some of the things which are forthcoming, um, as I've mentioned the asymmetry analyses already, and that I will be looking at the crania, uh, that that's the other obvious part of the skeleton to look at, partly because the fossil hominin record is largely cranial. Um, and then we will try to apply what we've learned to the fossil hominins. There are also other people working on, on this project, uh, both on the, um, the project uh, led by Tim Weaver, so the, the rhesus macaques, um, at the moment, we're trying to get some better genetic estimates of admixture. Uh, at the moment, we're working with pedigree records, but it would be um, it would be better to have a uh, genomic um, estimate of the admixture and also to compare that with the pedigree would be interesting. Uh, Leslie is looking at the dentition at the moment, and we will be looking at other skeletal regions um, in the in due course. I'm also working on. Um, on a complementary project with some of the same people, so with, with David and Tim, and also with Chris Stringer, Suyoshi Ito, Aurelia Munier, and Yoshi Kawamoto. And we're looking at how uh, the relationship between Japanese and Taiwanese macaques and their hybrids can be applied to hominin uh, fossils, but that's in very early stages. So I'd like to thank uh, Lucy and Karis very much for inviting me to speak. Uh, obviously, I'd like to thank my collaborators and people who helped me with both the data preparation and collection and the analyses. Um, and thank you very much for listening. That's brilliant. That was fascinating, Laura. Thank you very much. Um, uh, as before, ah, straight away, um, is that a question, Jenny, or is that just applause? I think it's just applause. Um, I think the was wrong. I thought that was, it looked like it had only taken about, um, 15 minutes or so, but actually I see that it's nearly two o'clock, so apologies, I would have sped up if I'd realised. Well, that's fine. Uh, as before, by all means, uh, put questions in the chat um, or uh, or just put your hand up. Um, while we wait for that, um, can I sort of abuse Chair's privilege to ask you a question, Laura? Um, the, the couple of things you said at the start really sort of resonated with uh, my understanding of the fossil record, and one of them is this idea of mosaics. Um, and it strikes me that in terms of the record of Homo sapiens, particularly in Eastern Africa over, if you look at any fossil published between about 200,000 and 100,000 years ago, it's always described as having a mosaic of primitive and derived features. Um, and often the sets of primitive and derived features are different from one fossil to another. And that's mostly, a, mostly cranial features, I guess. Um, and it's normally explained as being some kind of generic progression towards what we might regard as modern morphology or as something to do with sort of reproductive isolation, et cetera. But do, do you think there's some kind of um, possibility that hybridization is playing a, a role here as well? I mean, perhaps between regional subpopulations rather than species per se. Yeah, I definitely think it could play a part, but also that we would expect to see those mosaics. Um, and that different things, as you say, seem to be going on in different fossils. So we tend to see um, so-called modern uh, traits in the face, but then there are certain individuals a bit later where the, the back of the skull is more modern, but the face is less modern. And we don't actually know which of those kind of is on the line, which goes on to be part of later uh, humans. So at the moment, I think we don't understand the relationships between those fossils well enough to really understand the the evolution of those traits into a kind of cohesive pattern that you eventually get with the species that we that we have around today. Um, however, I would expect hybridization certainly to be going on. Um, we know that there were more than one taxon around at the time, um, and the genetics seems to show not only the interbreeding events that we know about between humans and Neanderthals and humans and Denisovans, but also potentially other African um, taxa as well. So I, I wouldn't like to guess which features might be the result of hybridization, but I would definitely expect it to be going on. Great, thank you. Uh, Nida, would you like to ask your question? Oh, yes, thank you. I just wondered if um, for different taxa, there are different parts of the anatomy that are more subject to hybridization or not. Has, has that been? That's a great question, um, and I would love to know. Um, I think we just don't know at this point, but we do know that certain parts of the skeleton are more likely to vary. So stabilizing selection 
um, seems to affect the parts of the skeleton which are, um, are kind of used for lots of different things, if that isn't too simplistic a way of putting it. So the cranium, for example, is doing an awful lot of stuff. It's got all the organs of sense. It's um, also involved in speech and it's housing the brain. Um, and it seems to be the part of the skeleton that varies least. Whereas the long bones, for example, can vary in lots of ways and still be functional. As long as the joints still work, they can vary a lot in length. They can vary in shape to a certain degree. So I would expect the kind of the, the cranium and to an extent the pelvis to be less affected by, um, by hybridization, at least in, not necessarily actually that it's less affected by hybridization, but that we would see that variation in um, successful offspring. So you might get variation acting on, on regions such as the cranium, but perhaps those hybrids would not be viable. They would perhaps not be born or they would be born younger. So in, in things that are being passed down uh, successfully throughout generations, I would think you're looking at probably the postcranial morphology more than the skull and the, and the um, pelvis. So I, I said I was looking at the pelvis for all these reasons because it's a really interesting place to look at, but I do think it's perhaps one of the regions which we would expect to be affected less. Um, even with that greater variation between human and Neanderthal morphology. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so John has just put in the chat, um, very enjoyable talk with wonderful graphics. Presumably one group may be bigger in physical size than another. When you size standardize, is there an allometric component and can you separate that? So the shape analyses are um, standardized for size. Um, did we, I'm going back a bit. I, they're not actually very different in size. I believe we did look at lometry and it didn't make a big difference. I think I looked at form and that didn't make any difference to the analysis of shape. But when I'm, uh, when I'm looking at the postcranial analyses, which are obviously linear measurements, I'm expecting that size will have, obviously have a bigger effect than the shape analyses. So that's somewhere where I'll, I'll look at that again, um, but I believe it didn't have much of a difference. I don't think there was a big al um, allometric effect in the shape of the pelvises, no. Not once sexual dimorphism uh, accounted for at any rate. Um, obviously that's part of the sexual dimorphism, which was a big effect. Great, thank you. Um, so can I then just ask one more, um, if you don't mind? Um, and it's a bit of a nebulous one, I'm afraid, but what, what do you think, I, I don't know if you considered this, but what might be the, the cultural effects of um, hybridization or, or simply of contact between um, different subpopulations or different species? And, and do you think there's anything that we can extrapolate from the kind of dynamics you're seeing in the morphology to, to cultural dynamics? That is a, a fascinating question, perhaps one that I'm not really qualified to answer. So it would be really interesting to talk to archaeologists about this. But I think that one of the areas where it's interesting is this idea of re mate recognition. So this is one way in which we define species. Perhaps um, individuals are perfectly biologically able to interbreed, but they might not if they don't see each other as mates. Whereas Neanderthals and humans did interbreed at least on several occasions. We don't know how common it was. So those individuals did at least recognize each other as mates. And I think that might tell us something about how similar their culture was, because for humans, I think um, how we recognize other humans, or in this case, a different type of human, but still as a potential mate would be at least partly culturally constrained. So perhaps that tells us that the, their cultures were in some way, um, what's the word? Uh, they weren't so different that they perceived each other as being, um, non-human perhaps i mean I, I i don't like the term human too much to be used for other species because i think it's more of a philosophical concept than a biological um thing but it, i think in this case maybe it's appropriate so they obviously recognize each other as being part of the same group in some ways being similar um and i think culture would have played a role in that i think it would be fascinating to see if we do um identify hybrid populations in the fossil record to see if that's something that could be picked up on in the archaeological record. I mean, this is going way beyond speculation, but if the Chateau Peronian, for example, turned out to be associated with uh, um, morphological hybrids, that would be amazing. Thank you. 
Yeah, it, it, it certainly would. Um, okay, let me just have a quick look in that in the chat. Okay, I guess we ought to wrap it up since we've gone a bit over time. Also, let you go and uh, let everybody else go. So, thanks once again, Laura. That was that was really interesting, and uh, that's certainly going to sort of uh, stimulate a lot of thought for me, and I'm sure everybody else here. So. Um, thanks again. Great talk. Um, and we'll wrap it up there. And just to say, please join us again next week um, when uh, I believe Vivian Sloan is our speaker next week. So I'm sure the, uh, the spectra of Denny will be, will be raised again. And uh, thank you all for joining us. And, and thank you again, Laura. Thanks, Laura. That was brilliant. Thank you. If anybody, um, obviously I went over time. So if you have a question and you'd like to email me, please do. I'd be happy to talk about it. Great.